Okay. So when we left off, we just uh, talked about, uh, well, the, this morning we talked about the general, I'm going to turn this to the mic, there's a little bit of feedback. How about still good sound? All right. So this morning we talked about the general interface for R, specifically as using the R Studio uh, GUI. Um, we talked about uh, doing computations in R using math. And I can, indeed. That, thank you very much. Um, so we talked about doing math in R, doing logic in R. We talked about uh, storing things into memory in R, and uh, also running functions, creating fun using functions that are already predefined in R, uh, using functions that other people have created and uh, provided as in a package, and um, creating our own functions, and specifically when we create our own functions, what the consequences of assignment to local variables versus global variables. Um, so, what I thought I'd uh, do for this afternoon is talk about reading in data. So, uh, if you have your workspace uh, like you have with mine, I've got some things open. Um, if you feel like saving any modifications that you've done to the file, um, just click the save button and we'll just close it. And I have this other file open, I'm just going to close it as well. I'm also going to go to my workspace and I'm going to clear my workspace because I want to start from fresh. And uh, what I'd like to talk to you about first is how I generally um, organize my uh, data files and my R scripts uh, just on my computer in the file system. So I'm going to use the um, file browser here that's in R Studio. And the general idea is that for every project that I have, where I've got a bunch of data associated with that project, I have a folder. So, uh, for example, this is a folder, the ant1 data. So I'm going to open up the ant1 folder, and in the ant1 folder, there's two other folders. A folder called analysis, and a folder called data. Uh, as you might expect, inside the data folder is a whole bunch of files, and presumably each one is a file from a given participant that ran through my experiment. Um, I typically do experiments in cognitive science where I'm getting uh, individual humans to play video games and so each uh, participant I get plays the game, creates a file, and uh, so each of the files from the experiment are in that uh, folder. The, in addition to a data folder in the ant1 file folder, there's an analysis folder. In the analysis folder is where I put all of my R scripts associated with that uh, project. Um, usually I'd give it a little bit more um, sensical name. So let's see, do I have the option to rename? Yes. So I can select that, I'm going to rename it, and I'm going to say ant1 analysis. That way if I need to search my computer for um, that file, I um, I know, I can search for ant1 and probably analysis and it'll come up. So the critical thing is that when I have the data structured like this, where I have a main project folder that has these two subfolders, I can always just open up the file um, that contains my R code. And as long as I uh, make the R Studio or R whatever version you're using, as long as I tell R where this file thinks it is, it will be able to figure out where the data is because it always knows the data is just up one in the folder hierarchy. So to go up one, we can click this arrow, up one in the folder hierarchy. Actually, you have to click the period, period. And then down one in a folder called data. So critical to the way I use R is that I have this uh, general structure where I always have two folders. That way, when I'm running my analysis, the, the uh, R is able to know exactly where the data is that I want to talk about. Um, so I've opened up the file, that analysis file, and I'm just going to bring up the console now. 
one thing to note is that while I've opened up this file, I still haven't told R to uh, look in the space where that file is in the folder structure. So you need to do something. You need to change the workspace. Um, can I do it by clicking? No. Um, I believe. So what you have to do in um, the uh, folder navigator here, you go to where that file is that you're interested in. So this is the file for the analysis. And there's a little more button. And there's a command called set as working directory, which ends up just pasting some text and running it, and that's a command in R. So what we've done there is we've told R not only to op open up this file, and we can see it over here, but specifically to when I'm referring to data files in my code, to start in that directory when it starts looking. Now we know that there's no data files in that directory, it's just the um, .r file. But we also know that all we have to do to get to the data is go up one directory and then down into a folder called data. So um, I believe, so we're going to uh, do a section on reading in data. The first thing I'm going to have you do is load a library that I, uh, load a package that I haven't talked to you about yet. The package is called Easy with an E and a Z, and uh, this is a package that I've authored. So this is something that I wrote, I um, put it on the R servers, and I happen to have already installed it on um, the server that you're connecting to right now. So I want to load in that package because it has a lot of useful functions, but also because it um, requires you to load in a whole bunch of other packages that in turn are also useful. So instead of having to write each of the packages that um, I want you to load in that are useful, you just load in easy and it handles loading in all these other packages. So when we run that first line, I'm just going to maximize the console here. When we run that first line, a whole lot's going to happen. And it's basically just loading in a whole bunch of the packages on which easy depends. You get some messages about things being masked. You generally don't really have to uh, worry about that. If uh, package authors have done things correctly, those, are, those messages are okay. So the first thing I want to do, let's go back to our file browser, and let's go up and down into data. I want to read I want to read in, let's say, this text file. If I want to just take a look at it, what does that text file look like, I can click it. And it'll open up over here. Um, so I can resize this panel so that I can see the text file all as one, so that the lines don't wrap. If I make the, um, as I make this panel smaller, the lines that are in the, in the actual data file start to wrap as they're presented on screen such that um, you get the same row gets, row of data gets printed across two rows in the actual screen. So you want to size the um, panel so that it is uh, wide enough to fit all of the data so that it doesn't wrap. So what I can see from this is that there's a whole bunch of uh, rows and columns in this data set, and I want to read it in. So... Uh, one thing to note is that it has a header that is a, a row of data that tells me what each column should be named. So if um, I want to read in that file, I know that I have to set header to equal to true. Um, but I also need to tell it what file I need. So we're going to use read.table. We're going to pass it in named arguments, uh, file, sep, and header. Um, We've talked about header a little bit already, so I'm going to set header to equal true, because the default is false. I'm going to set sep equal to a tab, because I just happen to know that um, when these files were created, the columns are separated by tab characters. And file. Here's the tricky bit. R, when it just gets a string as the file, will just look in the working directory, which we set to be the analysis folder. 
if we want to say go up in the directory tree one and then down into data, you don't you not only give it the file name, but you have to um, give it a few more pieces of information. So you in the in the file name you type dot dot, which means go up one in the directory tree. And then slash data, which means go down into the data folder. And then another slash meaning now we're gonna deal with a file in the data folder. And then the name of the file. So you start with dot dot, which means go up, well dot dot slash means go up one folder from where R currently thinks it is. So R currently is looking in the analysis, the ant one analysis folder. Um, if we say dot dot slash, that means okay now go up one, yep. <laughs> Clear your console. Uh, Aha, uh -huh. try hitting escape and then enter. And then enter. Okay. Okay. Well, um, yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, so the dot dot slash means we are currently in the analysis folder, which is inside the ant1 folder. It means go up into the ant1 folder. And then data slash means now go down into the data folder that is inside the ant1 folder. And then we can refer to the file that we want that's in that folder. So this actually is not the name of a file in there. We have to get the name, which I will just type. Ant sub num onetxt I'll bring my console back up. Run this, and what it's going to do is it will go find that file. It will uh, read it in, recognizing columns as being separated by tab and uh, headers, uh, and recognizing that the first row that it encounters is a header row, giving names for the columns that it should encounter. So I'll run that, and I maybe look at my workspace, and now I've got this object called A. And I can view it, which shows it in sort of a Excel-like spreadsheet. You've got rows and columns nicely separated. Um, in contrast, here's again what it looked like if we tried to view it in just as a, as a regular text file. It doesn't look quite as nice. But here's how R has read things in. So clicking on the data object that you've just read in, um, and opening this little viewer is one way to just get it, eyeball the data that it's read in, make sure it looks like it's uh, read everything in properly. Um, another way of taking a look at the data that you've read in is to use the head command. So head will just print in the console the first six rows of data that it's read in. So I'm gonna run head, and there are the first six rows. So we can see that there's, um, what's nice about the first six rows is that we know what the um, names are of everything. Um, there's another way to get a sort of, a different sort of summary view of what's in the data um, that we just, or the data object that we just read in. The uh, easy pricey function comes from the easy package. All the functions in the easy package have the EZ at the beginning and then a capital letter that sort of indicates that the name of the function is starting. Um, again, those are arbitrary, arbitrarily named, but um, I thought it would be useful for people to recognize that something's from the easy package by putting easy at the beginning. So the easy pre-c function gives you outputs, again, in the console that will be very similar to what you might be familiar with if you are used to using SPSS, uh, specifically from the variable view pane that you have an SPSS. So if I run that, I'm going to get some output. It's saying that A is a data frame with 288 rows, seven columns. And for each column in the data frame, we get a row. Uh, we have this little table, so each column has its own row in the table. Um, 
You've got a column here that tells you what data type each is stored in each um, column of the data. So the first thing, the first column is being stored as a number, numeric. Second column, number. Third column, number. The fourth column is being stored as a factor. That's a data type we haven't encountered yet. Uh, we've encountered numbers, they're numeric. We've encountered uh, logicals, we've encountered strings. Um, we haven't encountered factors. What a factor is, is R's way of, um, when it reads in the data, if it recognizes that there's a lot of repetition in a column, it will uh, basically try to save memory by, instead of uh, storing this whole big string, or sorry, this value here as the string N-O-N-E and having that many times, it turns out to be just computationally easier to um, realize, for it to realize that there are um, four unique values in that column. That's what this indicates, the number of unique values. So for Q, there's four unique values in that column. And then in its own internal representation of the data, it um, just assigns each value, each unique value, a number. So instead of having to store the whole string N-O-N-E, it just stores the number, say, one, and then whenever it needs to print the value of that thing, it just looks up what the label associated with the level one is. So it's not really that important in the context of um, reading in the data. Um, it gets more important when you start doing um, statistics because um, in order to set um, contrasts for analyses, you need to have your um, uh, variables, your predictor variables set up as factors um, in most circumstances. So what we see here is that while well, the first three columns have all been read in as numbers, which kind of makes sense, subnum, maybe not a, uh, something that we want to have as a, treated as a true number. For example, subject four is not twice subject two. Um, so we'll probably convert that to a factor uh, momentarily. Lock and trial, those are reasonably um, left as numbers. Q flank, well, I happen to know the design of the experiment that generated this data, and these indeed are um, independent variables, predictor variables that uh, were manipulated in the experiment. So they. This is just listing on a given trial what level of those manipulated variables was presented to the participants. RT, um, as I said, I play, I um, collect a, a lot of data where I get people to play simple video games and we measure how fast they react to things as well as how accurate or not they are. So we've got a column for RT, which is numeric, and a column for error, which is also numeric, but it only has two unique values. That's what this column says here. It has two unique values, either zero or one. You can also see um, this min and max uh, information about the data frame is helpful. So we can see that uh, there's only one unique value of, of subnum, so it's just one. Six unique values of block, so it goes from one through six. 48 unique values of um, trial, going from 1 through 48. A, uh, four unique values of um, the Q factor. And the min and max here um, simply tell you what was considered the first level and what was considered the last level. Um, that's not really important right now. It will get important later on. It just tells us somewhat the ordering of the factors. Flank, again, says that the first level is congruent. Uh, the third, the max, the third level is neutral. Um, and with RT, it says there's 288 unique values for RT, which makes sense. It's rare in an experiment for somebody to press the, or to respond precisely as quickly um, as they did on a previous trial. But we also get the minimum and the maximum of our team, which is useful to sort of eyeball how performance is doing in uh, an experiment. Um, let's say we want to actually compute not the minimum and maximum, but the mean of the 
uh, RTs for this person. How do we refer to, now that we've got this data object A, which is called a data frame, as I described earlier, a data frame is a uh, matrix-like object that has rows and columns, but where the columns are allowed to be different types of data. So we've got this object called A, this data frame A. How do I refer to things within A? Well, if I want to refer to a column, I use um, this syntax here. I say, the, the, I give the data frame's name, which is A, and I use the dollar sign, and then I give the name of the column that I want to refer to. So if I want to get the mean of all the values in the RT column, I write the code that's in example three. Mean parenthesis A dollar RT. And that computes the mean of all the values in the RT column. Now, now that we know how to refer to columns within a data frame, we should go back and uh, fix this uh, scenario where the this, this subject number was um, read in as a numeric variable. It really doesn't make sense to ever treat subjects as a numeric variable. This is just an arbitrary label we assign to subjects and it, we tend to want to just give them ID numbers. Um, so what I want to do is I want to modify the contents of that subnum column. So this example is a little outdated, so I have to modify it somewhat to give it the actual names of the column. I'm going to expand this. So what I need to do is, in the same way that I can um, assign something to A by putting A on the left-hand side of an equal sign, I can assign something to replace the contents of um, that specific column within A. So when I say A dollar subnum equals, that means take the contents in A dollar subnum, erase them, and replace them with, and the thing that we're replacing them with is just a modification of the original contents. So. Again, we will take the original contents, a dollar subnum, and it will apply the factor function, which simply serves to turn a numeric variable or even a character variable, some data type, into a factor. So if I run that, and then I run the easy pre-c, it will show that subnum is now treated as a factor not super important in the context of just one subject because there's only one value in that column, but um, later tools that we'll be using uh, really prefer things that aren't numbers to be fact um, already converted to factors. So I'm just going to open up the file browser again. So we dealt with this file, subnum.txt. There's another file here. I'm just going to click it. It's subnum uh, subnum1.csv. CSV is a very common um, file format out of a lot of spreadsheet programs. It's comma-separated values. So if you see here, it's the exact same data as I had in the .txt file, but it, uh, instead of tabs separating the columns, there are commas separating the columns. Um, so how would I go about reading in that data? Well, I would do the same as I did above. Uh, do copy that. So specify the file location by saying go up one in the directory structure and then go down into the data folder. And then um, we're going to give the file name this time we're going to read the file whose last three characters is .csv. It still had a header, so we're leaving that argument as um, untouched equals true. But where before we had uh, sep equals tab character, now we're just saying sep equals comma. That'll read in the data, and I can show just the first few lines. Okay. 
So it's the exact same data as we had before. Yeah. So, are you able to see? So, when you click the, I guess the home uh, icon here, do you see Ant One in your? Um, yeah. So you can click that. Okay. Um, and when you click data, you can see that there's files there. Yep. So what I suspect is that something's gone awry in this. Now, the file that you would have opened up, the ants1analysis.r, um, it had some, I think it had id1 instead of, so I had to change the name here. So you have to make sure that it's ant underscore subnum1. Um, and capitals do matter, matter. so uh, data needs to be capitalized and ant needs to be capitalized. Let's see. And I wonder. Um, Is anybody not having that problem? Okay, a number of you are not having that problem. What user, for somebody who's having the problem, what user number are you? No, it should be, should work. Hmm. I wonder if you were all accessing it too quickly. So if you try now, it doesn't work. All right, let me, I'm just gonna run up and take a look and maybe since more than one person is having problems, Um, little tiny things um, that you forget. So, for example, putting quotation marks around the entire name of the file um, or the path to the file. Um, 
will throw things off. And the errors that you'd get, it is one of the biggest uh, complaints about R as a whole is the errors that you get aren't very helpful. Um, so I'm gonna, for example, do that and run. And the error that I got here was dot dot object not found. Um, it's kind of hard to, I guess, R just isn't smart enough in the way it's, uh, sorry, isn't smart enough to realize that what you actually meant was to put a quotation around the entire thing in that circumstance. There's a number of circumstances where it's just, um, really, it's about uh, machines just in some ways can't uh, see what you intended and um, it's hard for them to give you meaningful errors then. So if we've got this example though, um, we've read it in, uh, we've seen that we can read in a data file uh, regardless of whether it's a tab delimited text file or a comma delimited .csv file. Um, there's actually another way to uh, read in .csv. There's, uh, if you remember from the help page for uh, read.table, it actually listed a function called read.csv. So if I say csv, if you use read.csv, you don't have to put the sep argument because its default for the sep is comma. So it just turns out that CSV is such a common data file, um, I guess, output format from things, they decide to make a whole function where um, the default, where it's basically read.table, except for slightly different defaults, one of which is that the um, sep argument is, its default is um, not white space, as is the case in read.table, but instead its default value is a comma. So, um, I am going to go and actually modify one of the files. So, this is one of the files that we were playing with, the .txt one. I'm going to go in and uh, change one of these values to this character string n a, all capitalized. Then I'm going to click save. What does that do? I'm just going to go up and copy that place and change back to the .txt one. So I'm going to read in the data file ant subnum onetxt which is the one that I just modified. I know that that is a tab delimited text file and that it has a header at the top. And I'm going to read that in and then I'll immediately print the head of A. So, read that in. And that go. Maximize this. And now you see that in this printout, we've got an NA there. Um, furthermore, If I uh, run an easy precy on it, what happens is that the output reflects that in the RT column, which is what we modified, there's one missing value. So NA is the uh, way that R recognizes missing values. Let me go back and uh, instead of NA, I'm going to put something different. Um, uh, nope. So maybe our data generating program, whenever there is missing data, it printed the word nope. Try that same read as before. Just gonna copy that file name. I'll run that. And if I look at the head of A, now, oh, I think the behavior's changed since I last, uh, oh, no, what's happened is I modified it, but I didn't save, hence the red, so I'm, 
it still was reading in the version of this file that still had NA there. So I'm going to save for now. I'm going to read it in. It looks a little different than what we had way up here. When we had it in uh, as an NA there, it printed NA and then it printed these as nice sort of rounded numbers. Now, when we have it, we have many more digits being printed in the output here. We've got nope. So what's happened? If I run an easy pre what's happened is that um, when reading that column, R saw a string of text that it didn't recognize. R is not built to recognize the word nope. Um, and it just thought, okay, what's in this column must be all characters or um, a factor. So it chose to turn that entire column, ignore the fact that RTs are actually numbers, because um, it doesn't actually know that, and it decided that that column must be just a factor. Nope being one of the levels, the other 287 rows being other levels of this factor. That's obviously not what we wanted to have done. So what we, if we have an output format that's like that, instead of, I mean, we could go in and replace that with NA for each one of our data files. Um, NA is something that R knows about and can expect. Um, if we did that, that would work, um, but it might be laborious, and I really don't like the idea of modifying raw data files. I think wherever possible, you should leave your raw data files as they come out of your experiment and make any modifications um, via code. So the way to achieve that in R is um, to explicitly tell R that when it encounters the string nope, to interpret that as an NA, and that's what the NA.string argument to read.table is about. Let's actually bring up the um, help for read.table. Uh, so, look going through the list of arguments, header file set, quote, da, 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 NA strings a character vector of strings which are to be interpreted as NA values. Um, so if I knew that sometimes it said nope, sometimes it said nah, -uh, um, I would uh, be able to supply multiple values, all of which would be automatically converted to, by R to NA. So if I run this, I just have one value that I know is in there that um, means NA, so I'll run that, maximize my um, output, and I'll run this again, head A, there we go. And now, even though the file actually says nope, R has been told to interpret that as missing data. And just to show again, easy pre again, it's recognizing that NA as indicating missing data. What happens though if in our um, data file, which I'm gonna expand here so I can see it a little bit better. Usually I don't have to do so much expanding, collapsing of my uh, windows, but because I'm on a very small screen here, I, I have to. Um, so what if, let's see, I just had nothing there. So we've got a tab, nothing, and then another tab. And I'll make sure to click save. I try to read that same data file. I well, they may have changed the default behavior so that it actually works. So let's give it let's give it a look. Do the head of A. Oh yes, it does. So if you actually literally have nothing there, it also automatically interprets that as NA. Um, if I though had just this column, for some reason in the experiment, um, it didn't have any values to the right. So 
this row has fewer values, fewer columns in it than subsequent rows. What R will do is it will tell us that it doesn't like that. So the error here is line one, it tells you what line was the culprit. So if it happened on a later line, you can figure out what line is the culprit. Um, but here is line one, so it's easy, easy to see. Line one didn't have seven elements. When it read in the header, because we told it it had a header, it read in seven names for columns. So it was expecting seven elements for every row. But it encountered line one, which didn't have seven elements, because I deleted them. Um, so the way to fix that, if that truly was the data coming out, if um, you just didn't have any values in your data file for that, um, the way to fix that is to use the fill argument. The fill argument will simply, if you are expecting seven columns and in a given row you only get, say, five values, it puts NA for the final two values. So everything's read in fine. If I say head of A, we see that it's filled those last two values with NA. Now, um, a lot of time files, so the purpose of this session is to, uh, I'm gonna undo a bunch of that. So the purpose of the session is to cover some well, one, to give you a feel for using read.table, it has all sorts of arguments and um, the scenarios under which you'd use them, uh, but it's also to uh, give you some feeling for the common types of weird data structures that experiments uh, create. So another scenario is when you have um, a data file where it has not only a trial by trial or sort of um, matrix-like uh, rows and columns output of data collected during the experiment. But sometimes there's, I don't know, demographic info at the top. So age equals 20, um, group equals 10. Or, um, um, and so maybe there's some stuff at the top that uh, you might not want to read in. Uh, this stuff is actually, th these are this is information that you actually might want to read in so that you can um, associate that information with your data. Uh, maybe so. Time of test. Okay, so time of test maybe is not something that you'd be that interested in. So you've got some, a row of information that you don't care about a blank line, and then your data starts. To, if I were to simply try to tell R to read that data file in, it's going to give us an error. Size this so you can see the error, and run. So it says more columns than column names. It's not super helpful. What's actually happened there is that it's because we said the first line is a header, it read in this as a header, and then it encountered a flank line and encountered these. So it's, um, it's uh, being mis misled. What you need to do is uh, you need to tell it to skip some lines when it's reading in data. So. We know that there's two lines that it needs to skip. It needs to skip the first line and then this blank line. So when we do that, it reads in fine. We say head of A, and it shows us A as we expected it to be. So. I think I have some other data. 
that's all I wanted to do with um, this. Just going to check something. I feel like I wanted to do more with that specific data set. But let me open up this. Ah, yes, okay, I understand. Um, let's. Uh, Right. So in your file browser, if you're following along, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go start a new project. So I'm going to clear my history. I, mean, I, I could just sign out or close our studio if it were running on my computer and then reopen it. But clearing your history is the same as uh, restarting, um, although it still keeps all your packages um, uh, loaded in. So. I do want to use the easy package, so I'll take the shortcut of just leaving it as is. Um, so, but I've cleared my workspace. I'm going to go to my file browser. I'll click home. And in the home directory, you should have an ant2 folder. Oops. No, and in that ant2 folder is a data folder and an analysis folder. Um, data, of course, has a whole bunch of data files. Analysis has this file, a .r file. Not great name, so I'm gonna rename it. Uh, and hmm. analysis. Save. Uh, yes. Right. So I'd opened it and then I renamed it, which meant that it had to close it. I still have Ant One analysis open. Um, I can save it, which it apparently already has been saved, and then I'm gonna close it. I don't need the ant subnum file open, so I'm going to close that. But I do want to open up this new file called ant2analysis. And I also want to change the working directory so that R is looking at this folder. So I will click more and set as working directory. All right, I'm going to expand the console because I don't think I need the files um, anymore. Um, oh, you know what? I do need the files. What I need to do is I want to go take a look at the structure of one of these files. Because I specifically designed these files to be a little bit different than the files that we just saw. So I'm going to click on the ant subnum one. I'm going to expand this so that you can really get a feel for what it looks like. So immediately you can see there's some useless information at the top. Um, so we need to skip some data at the top of each file. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of data, but it stops. And then there's a bunch of space, and then some more useless stuff, and then another block of code. Um, this is the type of thing that something like SciScope will uh, output. Um, it will have these chunks of data. So you need to figure out some way of... Um, of reading in that data. So the file name is the same uh, as earlier. It's just in a different folder. Um, so you say file equals uh, quote, quote dot dot slash capital B data capital A N T underscore subnum one dot txt close quote and in the console. So we told it where to find the file that we want to read in next. We told it it's tab delimited. We've said that there's a header on the file. We've told it to skip the first four um, rows because we know that those are some junk rows. We also want to tell it how many rows to read in because if we tell it to just keep reading until the end, it's going to read in, it's going to eventually hit the white space and um, have trouble. So what I want to do is just read in the first 32 rows, which if we looked at that data file is um, the number of rows it is in a given chunk. So it, well, it starts at uh, 6, goes to, oh, so it's not going to be, it's going to be uh, 48.
And we want the number of rows to be 48. If I run that, you can see if we want to take a look at it in our, in our data thing, it's, uh, it's at 48 pops, so 48 rows of seven variables, seven columns. I can click that and you can see that it's in the nice tabular format. That Um, I can also just take a look at the head of A that way. Um, now let's say that I want to read in the next chunk of data. So I read the first chunk of data into an object called A. Uh, I still want to keep that around because I want to combine it with the next chunk of data. I'll create a new object called B. This time I'm reading from the same file. It's that file still Tabs, tab delimited, and has a header in each chunk. Um, still want to read in 48 rows. But this time I want, and I still want to skip the first four rows, but I also want to skip the first 48 rows, which are the number of rows that go ahead. So when you're in your home, do you see ant2? So in the file browser, when you're at the home, you click home, do you see ant2? Yep, and you also, if you go into data, you see the data file? Okay. And the quotations are all there and the capitalization is all the same? I will take a moment to double check. All right, so if you've got your working directory set properly, it should have the tilde slash ant2 slash analysis slash. All right, so we're trying to read in this other chunk of data from that same file. We've already read in one chunk that's 48 rows long. Uh, we want to read in another chunk. Uh, we know that the first four rows in the data file are um, just junk. Open it up again. We also know that the two chunks are separated by a whole bunch of rows. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven rows. So it's going to put plus seven. So we're going to skip the first four rows plus the 48 rows that consist of the first chunk. Um, actually, we have also have to say plus the single row, uh, it's 49 rows of the first chunk because the first uh, row of the first chunk is treated as a header by the first read. And then there's seven just blank lines. So, size, and top row. Now I've got B, which is 48 obs observations of seven variables. I say head of B. You can see that if I uh, do head of A, it's block one, head of B is block two. So we've read the first chunk and the second chunk. If I wanted to combine those two pieces of information into a single data frame, which makes sense because they're all data from the same person and same experiment. What I can use is use the rbind function. The rbind function will just take um, a list of uh, data frames separated by commas and combine them by rows. 
So that's where the R comes from, from in, the, in the R bind name. There's also a C bind function that combines data frames by columns. Um, you're probably not going to use that during this workshop. So the R binds, we're going to create a new object called both that consists of whatever R bind spits out when you give it A and B as arguments. That's going to be a data frame consisting of the combination of A and B. So both is being created. It's got 96 rows. Makes sense because it's 2 times 48. And we can take a look at its uh, summary. Um, and we can see that there are two unique values for block. So both blocks are in there. Now, if I need to keep doing this over and over, because I've only read in two of the blocks, and there's, there's, a, there's a lot of blocks in here. Two, three, four, five, six. It's going to be a lot of typing. Whenever you seem to be doing the same thing over and over, so I seem to be doing the same read dot table over and over, the only thing that's changing is how many rows I'm skipping. Um, whenever you find yourself doing the same thing over and over, it's a good idea to try to turn that thing into a function and um, make the function change its behavior as a, well, as a function of its arguments. So I know I want to read dot table over and over and over, I just want to skip different numbers of rows. So what I can do, I'm going to create a function called do read. The way this function works is it takes an argument called block num, and it's going to just do that same read.table that we have above. Um, this time, let me change this to 48, and so. We're skipping 49 plus um, 7. So we're skipping the first four rows for everything. Uh, ah, right. It's just going to be 4 plus. I'm going to take that out there. All right. So a little bit complicated here, but what's going to happen? Anytime you do a call to, anytime you um, call the function do read, you're going to supply it a block num. Every time it uh, is run, it's going to uh, read from the same data file. Um, it's always going to read 48 rows. But depending on what value you put in the block num arguments to the function, this computation is going to come out differently. The first time you, if, if you ask for block 1, then this is going to be 1. So 1 minus 1 is going to be 0. So that whole thing is going to be 0, because anything times 0 is 0. So if you put in one, it's going to skip four lines. Well, that's what we had above when we wanted to read the first block that was in that file. We had to skip four lines. Um, if you put in two, however, block num minus one is going to be two minus one, so that's going to be one. So it's going to skip the first four lines plus one times 49 plus seven. Well, that's what we had up here, 49 plus seven. And it's going to continue for block uh, 3. It's going to be 3 minus 1. It's going to be 2. It's going to skip and skip and skip. So what we can do, run this to define the function. If we want the first block to be stored in an object called A, we can run. Oh, I didn't change the data file name from what was in here originally. There we go. All right. So A is being, being read in. I can do the same. So, so the first block is being read into an object called A. Second block read into an object called B. 
well, I'm going to run these all at once. ABC. Still have both in memory. It doesn't matter. What we're going to do is R bind A, B, and C all into one thing called all. And take, take a look at the summary of all using easy crazy. We can see that there's three unique values now in the block column, indicating that we've read in all three columns. Uh, So another way of doing things, example five. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you had the definition of do read, and then you ran that, and then you ran all three of these lines. Um, I had to modify, it, originally the file said uh, 0, 1, 2, and so I put them as 1, 2, 3, and all the equals are by A, B, C. All right, how's, so what we've done here is with example four, we took the scenario where we wanted to do this, read several chunks of data out of a file and, but simplify our coding by having a single function that has a modifiable, whose behavior is modifiable due to um, an argument that you can specify to it. So instead of having to call read.table multiple times um, explicitly, you can do it implicitly and have less typing to do by um, calling this do read function. But you still have to do a little bit of work in that you have to know how many, um, or you have to explicitly go through and grab each data frame and explicitly combine them all together. The next example introduces you to um, something that's very important in um, at least the way I use R. Um, it's a function that allows you to automatically um, read in or apply the same function to a list of things and get out all the um, data frames combined as one. So it's the ldply function. And the way the ldply function works, the ldply function is, a, is from the plier family of functions. Plier is a package for R that was already read in when we um, loaded up the easy package. And all of the plier functions have a letter, and then another letter, and then the word ply. So the first letter is, um, tells you as the user 
what you should be passing in as the type of data that the function that the uh, function is going to use. So L means it wants a list. A list could be an actual list in uh, R's data types, but um, a series of numbers is also considered a list. Um, D means that uh, tells me as the user what this function is expecting to spit out as a uh, uh, as a data format. So it's expecting to spit out a data frame. So if this were so this is ldplyy, it means that it expects a list coming in and it's expecting to spit out data frames um, or a data frame. If it were llplyy, we would expect to take in a list and spit out list. If it were ddplyy, it would take in a data frame and spit out a data frame. Um, so ldplyy is what we're using here, list in, data frame out. And all the arguments to all of the uh, uh, ply functions um, annoyingly start with this dot. So dot, the, the period as a character is a legal character to use in um, uh, naming things. So the first named argument to the ldplyy function is dot data. And because it's ldplyy, we know that l, it wants a list in. So I'm going to give it the list one through six. I could just say c one, two, three, four, five, six, but that's more typing. I can just, well, I'll just say one through six. The second argument that ldplyy wants is, is named dot fun. And I'm going to pass it a function. So um, dot fun is always a function, or at least ldplyy wants dot fun to be a function. And what ldplyy is going to do is it will automatically handle running this function many times, each time grabbing uh, the next element in this list and supplying that element as the argument to the function that you're passing. So the first time it runs through, it's going to run through and it's going to say do read one, just like we had up here. It's going to say do read one. Then it's going to say and store the resulting data frame in temporary memory. Then it's going to go on and say do read two and store the resulting data frame in memory. It's going to do do read three, do read four, do read five, do read six generating six data frames that's going to be stored in temporary memory, and then it's going to collapse them all together all at once. So this is perfectly equivalent to doing If I did all of this, it would yield an object called all that contained all the chunks of data from that file. But that's how many lines? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines. And in contrast, this is three lines. So it's a little bit more parsimonious um, to do it this way. It also means that when you do it this way, you create an object called A, create an object called C, B, C, etc., and then you finally create an object called all but A, B, C, D, E, F are all objects that are just hanging around in your workspace, taking up memory that, don't need, that, they, that you don't need anymore. Whereas here, all those, whenever it reads in, uh, it's storing all those uh, chunks that it's read in into temporary memory, which gets released as soon as it uh, completes the function returning the final um, uh, data set. So. If I run all, if I run that, it um, will loop through all the values supplied here, each time supplying the value as the argument to the function supplied here. And I can run easy pray C, and I can see that indeed all six blocks were read in. There's six unique values per block, and 288 rows. That makes sense. Um, here, in this example, we'd previously defined do read as a function. It's sitting here in our, um, 
in our workspace. It's unlikely that later on in the project I'll want to use this do read again. I've read in the data. I don't need to read in any more data. So it kind of doesn't make sense to keep this do read function around. In fact, it doesn't make sense to have defined it in the global workspace in the first place. What you can do instead, and here I'm just going to do a clear all, just to pretend that I hadn't created do read in the global workspace in the first place. What you can do instead is I'm just going to copy do read and um, so so this is the call to LD apply that we had before. We had to go from one to six. And I previously had just do read there. But now do read doesn't exist. Um, what I can do is define do read inside the call to the LD fun, the LD apply function. And all that means is that I've just I just paste do read there. Um, you take off the name do read and you just say fun equals function and that's your function. So that way it will still have a function that is going to iterate over the list that you give it, returning finally the combined set of data, but you don't have this extra function that you're not going to use anymore sitting around in memory. It's a little bit cleaner. The, the main purpose of this is that, um, of, I guess, me demonstrating this is that, uh, to demonstrate that you can define functions within calls to other functions. Um, and those uh, functions that you define inside functions end up not being, um, they're only temporary. They stick around for as long as you need them and then they go away. So just to demonstrate that this actually works, I can run that. My workspace only has the final data object, it's nice and clean. Um, and yeah. So, we have this code here that deals with this annoying data set where you have the data separated into um, different chunks within a given file. We still haven't taken care of the, uh, or at least in the process of analysis, analyzing this data, presumably we want to analyze more than just one person's data. So if you have multiple data files, how do you deal with that scenario? Well, um, Pardon me? One line. Oh, so that's that's an example of wide format data. Um, so let me just bring this up again. Or I'll show this. So in this scenario, I've got a case, each case or each sort of unique value uh, measurement obtained from a person has its own row. So uh, this is a trial. It has two DVs, but this trial, those two DVs are related. They're from the same trial. Uh, so a given person, a given case, as one might say, um, has lots and lots of rows. That's called long data format. There's an alternative scenario where um, you have wide data format. I'm gonna cover that in just a moment. Um, R tends to prefer long data format. Um, usually it's what comes, is the most raw data that comes out of um, most programmed experiments, um, but sometimes not, and that's why I'm going to cover going from wide data format to long data format in a moment. Yes. So the next step we're going to do is try to figure out how to read in multiple subjects data. Um, taking our new knowledge of the LD ply function, what we can do is step towards that ultimate goal of reading in all the data from all the subjects. 
and just try to read in data from two subjects and just the first section, the first chunk from each of those subjects. So we know that um, we're going to call read.table. So here we're calling ldapply and in ldapply we've got um, a list specified as the input uh, argument dot data. So the list consists of uh, two elements. One element is sub one, the other element we'll say is sub two, and it's sub num one, and it's sub num two. I've split them across different lines just for visualization. Uh, they could have all been just on one line. And the ldplyy function also wants us to provide it with a value for this argument dot fun, which should in itself be a function. We could have defined a function outside in the global working space and, um, and just supplied the name of that function. But here we're going to simply define a function um, inside the call to ldplyy. So the function that ldplyy is going to use when it iterates over the um, value, the list that we give it to dot data, um, will take file name as its argument. So the first time this function runs, uh, this is going to be set as the value of file name. The second time the function is run, this is going to be set as the value of file name. And for a given file name, it's going to run this bit of code, which is just a call to read.table. The file that read.table is told to go look at is whatever file name is being run at that time. All the files we know are tab delimited. They all have a header. They all have, uh, you have to skip four rows at the beginning. And the first chunk is um, uh, 48 rows long. So if I want to just get the first two people and all of their first chunk, I can do this, and I will run, and I'll have a data frame where the unique levels of block is just one, because I just grabbed the first chunk from each person, but the unique levels of subnum are two, so I've grabbed the first chunk from each of those two people. If I want to grab all of the data from each subject, well, I already know how to grab all of the data from one subject. And this little bit here is showing me how to iterate over subjects. So what I can do is have what uh, could be called a nested series of calls to ldplyy. So this is what uh, is being achieved going to copy the data file names from example 7, and put them in example 8, and then I'm going to copy uh, this code from example 6. Example 6 showed how to grab all the data from a single subject, so what I should be able to do is um, create a function that iterates over the uh, I'm going to create a function I'm going to take the different file names of the different subjects and you can see why when you start getting these nested loops, it's important to have a nice uh, indentation. So the function will, for a given file name, run the code that we have from the previous example of reading all the data from a given subject. And I'm going to replace, that time we were only talking about subject number one. Here I'm just going to replace that subject file, um, that explicit specification of the file name with uh, just the word with the uh, variable file name, which is going to be changed each time this overall function is run. 
So we've got this outer LD apply function, which is iterating over the different subject files, and this inner LD apply function, which, given a subject file name, is iterating over the different block numbers. And okay. So, in essence, for each subject, we go in, we get each of their blocks of data, and then return that and repeat that for all the subjects. Uh, sorry, for just subjects one and two. So that runs all that code. If I take a look at what's in subjects one and two, I see that there's two unique values for subnum, six unique values for block, so and 576 rows. So it's very clear that we've read in all the data for subjects one and two. I'll show you a way to just double check that maybe there were missing data in there somewhere um, in a moment. Um, just, I guess, take it on faith for now that we have read in all the data for those two subjects. But I've got a lot more than just two subjects. I may have a few, um, I don't know, a few dozen. So if I want to do it for all my subjects, it's going to So this is just, I copy the code from example eight. So this is just a copy of the code from sample eight. I've renamed what the um, uh, final thing is being returned to as an object called all subs. So in example eight, I gave it a list of just two files. I could go and I could continue to list all the other files in my, in that folder. Um, but this requires that I, a lot of typing and doing things by hand, which is not a great idea. It's human error prone. The better way of doing it is just getting R to go and look in that folder and see what files are in that folder. So we're going to use the list.files function. So if we take a look maybe at our help for list.files. Um, it uh, produces a character vector of the names of files or directories in the names directory. So, list.files asks you, okay, where do you want me to look for files? The default is, the, is period, which means where you are right now, where R thinks it is right now, which is the current working directory. We don't want it to look in the current working directory because we set the current working directory to be the analysis folder. So we want to change that default to path equals dot dot slash data. So we want it to go up into the directory above the current working directory and then down into a uh, folder called data. Um, if you have lots of different, if, if all you have is text, is um, your data files in here, then this should be sufficient. Um, oh, you actually want it to also, so when it runs, um, when list.files runs, it will return a list of the files. If you leave it as is, it will just list the file names, but uh, we want it to list the file names with the full path to those files. So basically, we want it to append dot dot slash data to the file names. So um, you have to say full dot names equals so here's an example where we're using true. Uh, I guess we've used it before in header equals true. I can run just this little section to just check what um, it's going to return. So I can run that, and indeed that's all the files that I'd be interested in. And that's all we need to do to modify things so that it reads in all the data from all the subjects. Oh wow, we were supposed to stop 15 minutes ago, or 10 minutes ago. Um, it's a good place to stop because that's, for at least this type of weird data, this final um, bit of code will go through and read in all the data from all the blocks from all the subjects. And we'll have 5,760 rows of data, and 
seven columns, 20 unique subjects, six unique columns for each, and I will uh, continue uh, the workshop in half hour. Thanks.